five days since I served my SDBXW30 female of seven years. Now everyone is piling on me to talk to her. Part 3. Update 4. I haven't slept in a few days, at least I believe it's a few days. I'm not sure whether it's a little hazy right now. Since my previous article, I spent the most of my time with my father and visited Frank's wife in the hospital. She'll remain for a while since she's having a hard time coming to terms with her circumstances. I try to be helpful, but to be honest, I'm probably not much help to anybody right now. I was going to move back to my home today, but I'm going to postpone it until I get my feet back under me. I'm not sure what's going on with my wife. I'll go see her on Tuesday. Update 5. Anyway, first some background information on the present situation. Over the weekend, there were some changes. I wanted to present this message to Frank's wife and ask her permission before posting it publicly. Frank looks to have fled away. He has emptied out their joint, counts, and is nowhere to be located. We contacted the bank to attempt to reverse the payments, but they are unable to do so since the monies have already been transferred to a new bank. They can't do anything since they're married. He's likely the only one with access to the receiving account, and the new bank isn't giving any information. I suppose they are legally obligated not to. They were helpful in determining how to get a court injunction, I believe that's what it's called, but it would take time. We discovered out on Sunday evening, when he was due to pick up his children from his ex-wife. According to one of his pals, he departed sometime between Saturday and Sunday after being seen the Reddit threads. I used to despise him, but dang, I'm at a loss for words to convey how cowardly that is. He's robbing his own family. What the is wrong with this man? Frank's wife is filing today, and she is using my lawyer, which saves him time and money since he already has everything from me. He can essentially replicate my argument for her. I feel sad for her. She adores Frank's children and will most likely lose touch with them since she and Frank's ex-wife are not on good terms. I've been experiencing intense emotional upheaval. Over the weekend, I went from intolerable sadness to pure blinding wrath, and I fractured my pinky banging a door, so I wasn't in control of myself. I think I've got things under control now. My father has been a tremendous assistance, staying with me 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. I've been to Frank's wife's house and spoken to her on the phone a lot. At the moment, we are each other's emotional crutches and counselors. She is completely heartbroken. Her children are with her parents and she will most likely be released from the hospital this week. My father and I have volunteered to assist her financially if she needs it. Her job has also been quite helpful and under normal conditions she would be able to support herself and the children. However, their financial safety net has vanished. I still haven't spoken to my wife, and I'm at a loss for words. I'm not sure where to begin. I know meeting her would be emotionally draining, therefore I don't want to wind up in a squabble or something equally ineffective. My objective is to be as focused on the future as possible, I will attempt to view her as the mother of my children rather than the why and what of what she did. To the best of my abilities, I will strive not to regard her as my wife who betrayed me and the family. We will divorce, therefore we must concentrate on how we will go from here. We won't get far addressing it right now because emotions are still too fresh. We need to sort out custody and how she intends to re-establish herself as a mother to our children. Children rely on their mothers. I attempted to identify the five most critical issues or points of agreement we must reach in order to give the greatest possible treatment. We must guarantee that we provide our children with everything they need. I'd want to attempt to concentrate on this. But every time I sit down, I either type nonsense or gaze at the page, and nothing makes sense enough to write down. Please assist me with this. I need some clarity to cut through the mush in my muddled, sleep-deprived mind. This is where I am right now. I do not want to punish her. I want to get away, and I want my children to endure as little as possible. I want my wife to go on with her life and move on, just as I want to. We don't need to waste time on the divorce since it's already in the works, unless she wants to challenge it. I'm not sure what she wants to do yet. Everything in our life is now one big agonizing cluster duck. Priority one is to get it together enough to function for our children. We must act immediately. We also need to reconcile somewhat, at least on the roles of father-slash-mother. 
I don't believe we can reconcile on everything. However, we need enough to operate as parents. Priority. Two is this. We can probably get away with it for priority one. However, unless we addressed priority two, everything will fall apart and collapse over time. I don't want our lives to grow more angry and hostile to one another. I'm hoping you can assist me. I'm not looking forward to tomorrow. I'm hoping to stay focused enough to start a process between us to proceed in this route. Update 6. I've been sitting here for hours, replaying the events of the day in my thoughts, typing it out and retyping it over and again, trying to find the appropriate words to describe what's going on and myself. As several of you advised, I spoke with Sue's mother yesterday in preparation for our meeting today. I wanted to see if she had any further information to contribute. Sue is in a poor situation, she just confirmed. The only additional information she could provide was that when I dropped her off at the motel, Frank promptly departed. He simply passed by my wife, who was wailing on the floor of the hotel corridor. He didn't even seem to say anything. Sue told her mother this, at least. I also attempted to contact a couple of her friends, and I discovered that their friend group is now at odds, as several of her pals had actively promoted Sue's affair on their weekly girl outings. They typically go to the movies, theaters, and other such activities since they have all been friends since elementary school. The fans seem to be being shunned at the moment. The news of these occurrences has spread like wildfire. It seems to have prompted many spouses to begin asking awkward questions of their wives. I also discovered that my wife was not the only one who cheated. Apparently, there are two more cheats in her clique. As far as I know, the appropriate spouses have been told. Anyway, I thought I was ready to see my wife this morning. I'm embarrassed and disappointed to report that I wasn't. The meeting today was a huge catastrophe, a catastrophic failure. I didn't get a single thing correctly. I expected myself to be this rock of practical professionalism, with my own set of norms, my own point of view, and a list of critical things to prepare for. We were going to chat about kids, money, Sue's health, and other topics. We would find a solution and means to go forward. Instead, this day is burned into my memory as nothing but raw anguish and failure. I'm quite sure I'll carry this scar with me for the rest of my life. I'd been feeling uneasy for days, but a few hours before we left this morning, I began to feel incredibly agitated and apprehensive. I experienced a high-pitched whine in my ears, similar to an old television noise. For some reason, my mouth generated less and less saliva. My mouth was very dry. I tried to wish the stress away, to swallow it, to push it away, but it just made things worse. I'd been pacing about aimlessly for the past hour, which was possibly the longest hour of my life. I simply wanted it to be done when we eventually left, but I felt compelled to see her. I had probably been awake for 30 hours by the time we got at the hospital. I wasn't entirely functioning. I should have called it off at that point. We were also checked for fever and symptoms before being allowed inside the inn. I was already shivering and sweating profusely as I walked through the elevator doors. The face mask made breathing difficult, and my glasses fogged up somewhat with each breath. I guess I was on the verge of panicking. We were greeted by a doctor when we got at the ward. There was considerable deliberation before it was decided that my father may accompany me. I strained to comprehend the doctor as he discussed the dos and don'ts of this appointment. At this time, the whining in my ears sounded rather loud, and my pulse felt like a jackhammer in my chest. He indicated that Sue was stable but fatigued, and that if he felt it was necessary, he would stop the conference and return her to the ward. He informed me Sue had been calling all hours of the day and night for me. He asked me additional questions and I had to clarify what I was about to say. He also inquired as to how I was doing. Obviously, I didn't look very well. I simply told him I had to do it. We were led into a space that was most likely meant to make tourists feel at ease. We took a seat and waited. At this time, I was really suffering. I tried to concentrate on being productive seeing Sue as the mother of my children and my concerns. When my father saw that I was suffering, he placed his hands on my shoulders like he used to do when I was a child. He assured me that everything would be okay. It calmed me down a bit, and I realized how much I despise face masks now that I couldn't see his usual, it'll be okay, son, grin. 
The door was then opened, allowing the orderlies to enter. As they move aside, I see Sue, who is in a wheelchair, with her head at an odd side angle and her eyes closed, as if she is asleep. All my preparations fall to the instant I meet her. All I can see is my best friend from more than a decade ago. I see my confidante, the lady I adored. I see the first person I think of when I wake up and the last person I think of before falling asleep. My protective instincts hit me so strongly in the belly that I nearly vomit. At the time, I was prepared to go to any length for her, fight any war, and move any mountain. She's right in front of me, broken. My head feels like it's short-circuiting. I wanted to assist her, embrace her, hug her close, and tell her everything will be well. But, I can't F. Ing move. I attempt to open my mouth, but it won't open. It's so dry, like if it's cemented shut. I don't really know how to explain it. The closest I can get is standing in my own brain, peering out from behind my own eyes. If that's what you mean. It's like though I'm immobilized. It's like being in a nightmare where you can't move. My heart continues to pound faster and faster, harder and harder. I'm sweating like I'm made of cheese. Cloth and covered in cheese cloth. Something is said by the doctor. I'm unable to comprehend anything because of the now very loud screaming noise in my ears. He takes a seat next to my wife and speaks to her. Sue had a dreadful appearance. Drab and colorless, frail and deflated as if sitting is too much for her, she is one of those drip bags on one of those hospital hat racks that roll. Sue doesn't move, I keep looking back and forth at the doctor and the nurse, and everything becomes silent for an uncomfortably long period. Stay tuned for next part.